Great. Well, thanks, Janet, and thank you all for coming here uh, this morning. I'm never sure whether it's better to have a discussion before lunch or dinner when everybody's waiting, hungry, or afterwards when they have narcolepsy. So having it during lunch, we'll see how this works. Um, uh, again, welcome everyone. Uh, really, uh, thanks also to Senator Perdue from Georgia for helping to bring us together for this event. Um, I have to shill a little bit from Georgia, being at Emory. Um, and the state really has been a leader in research and funding to bring safe and effective regenerative medicine cures to clinical reality. Um, I was reminiscing, it's been now 10 years since Bud Peterson, when he was president at Georgia Tech, and I, when I was CEO of the Emory Woodruff Health Science Center, created the Joint Center for Regenerative Engineering and Medicine as a joint venture between the two schools, which now includes the University of Georgia and collaborates with dozens and dozens of research centers around the world. Atlanta, Georgia is also the home of the Marcus Foundation, which has been a strong supporter of R&D in regenerative cell therapies that address the needs of so many patients and families. The Marcus Foundation has funded over $100 million through 35 grants in FDA and IND approved clinical studies of autism, cerebral palsy, osteoarthritis, asthma, neonatal heart disease, frailty, among others. Um, you'll hear more about some of this work shortly. But we're all here because we know this exciting work in regenerative medicine has increased the possibility, but also the public demand for safe and effective cell therapy treatments. So we hope with increased federal support in partnership with the private sector, we can help meet both these opportunities and challenges. In particular, increased research funding from the NIH, regulatory assistance from the FDA, and supportive legislation from our elected representatives can make this all happen. So thanks again for your interest and participation in this briefing. And I'd like to introduce our distinguished panelists for this first session, which is on current clinical trials and the promise for patients. The bio sketches of all our panelists are in your packets and they're posted live on the webcast page. Each panelist will talk about their research and provide their personal insights about what is needed to bring these promising new therapies to reality. Our leadoff hitter, if you will, is a renowned investigator, figure in the field, Dr. Anthony Atala, who's the link professor and director of the Wake Forest Institute for Regenerative Medicine. Tony. Thank you so much, Fred, for that nice introduction. It's really great to be with all of you today. What a pleasure to share this panel with such a distinguished group of individuals from all over the country. What I thought I'd do today is really give you an overview of regenerative medicine and some of the work we're doing in North Carolina. This is the Wake Forest Institute for Regenerative Medicine here. This building is fully dedicated to this work uh, in regenerative medicine. As all of you know, the challenge is that we have a major crisis and shortage of tissues and organs. This has now been declared a public health crisis by the American Hospital Association. So this is a major challenge. And that's where we think that regenerative medicine really can make a dent. When we talk about regenerative medicine, we can talk about using scaffolds alone, cells alone, cells and scaffolds together, or enabling technologies such as bioprinters and bioreactors. This is an example of one of the cell therapies that's basically already in patients. You take a small biopsy, a small piece of tissue from the skeletal muscle, you expand the cells outside the body, you put them right back in the area where it's deficient. The nice thing about it is because the cells from the same patient and they're the same tissue type, they will be retained and they will function long term. And this is now being used for our next clinical trial for rotator cuff injuries. It's already been used for urinary incontinence. This is another technology that's, uh, that's been used in patients where we actually engineer the tissue. Here we take a small piece of tissue from the patient, we expand the cells outside the body. Four weeks later, we create the construct by taking a biodegradable scaffold that's made with the same materials that are used for stitches and surgery. They degrade on their own over time. But the cells are laid there, layer by layer, placed in a bioreactor, and then placed right back into the patient. And this was done for a patient that had, that had a, an injury of the urethra. That's a channel that connects the bladder to the outside of the body. And you can see here the x-ray with the defect on the left. 
In the second panel, you see the tubularized scaffold that's going to go away. On the far right, you see it's fully seated with cells. As the scaffold goes away, the cell, the cells themselves lay down their own bridge. That material that looks like a piece of your shirt or your blouse actually goes away, and the cells lay down their own bridge. And six months later, you're left with a patient's own cells and the patient's own bridge. And here on the second panel, you see the patient's x-ray with a new organ that they received that's been fully regenerated. And we published that work in The Lancet. When we published that work, we already had a six-year follow-up on these series of patients. The materials that we use, as I mentioned, are fully degradable, so they do not stay behind in the body, which is a good thing. And because the cells come from the same patient, there is no rejection. We've done the same thing for blood vessels. You can see here, we have this blood vessel in a bioreactor that's being exercised, if you will, before it gets placed back into the patient. And this has been used to replace various uh, vascular blood vessel defects. Same strategy for heart valves. You can see here this heart valve in the bioreactor. It's pumping away, and you can see in a minute the heart valve leaflets opening and closing. Same strategy. Now, this has not been used in patients yet, but we are now moving the technology forward to actually apply part of this technology into patients using bioengineered heart valves. We've also done more complex organs, such as bladders. Basically, flat structures of skin are the least complex. They're all complex. But architecturally, flat structures like skin are the least complex. Tubular structures like blood vessels, heart valves are the second level of complexity. Hollow non-tubular organs like the bladder, the stomach are the third level of complexity because the architecture is more complex and the cells are more complex. But same strategy here. We go to these patients that have end-stage bladder disease. We take a very small piece of tissue. We expand the cells outside the body, create the scaffold in the shape of the organ, we coat the outside with the muscle cells, the inside with the lining cells, put it in a bioreactor, put it back into the patient. And this patient series was published in The Lancet in 2006, and we're now moving to the next phase of the trials out of Wake Forest in North Carolina. We've also done this for kidney therapy. This is a therapy where you go to the patient with end-stage kidney disease, and you take a very small needle biopsy with a minimally invasive technique with just ultrasound guidance, of a very small segment of the patient's own kidney tissue. We then expand the patient's own kidney cells outside the body, and these are patients that have end-stage kidney disease, but they still have viable cells. We're then able to insert those cells back into the patient, and because they're kidney cells from the same patients, they will be retained, and they will not be rejected. And you can see here on the left, this is actually two functional kidney units that are circled in red. The, the, uh, the implant is placed, and you can see all these new units. And this is now in phase two clinical trials in the U.S. and 10 centers for patients with end-stage kidney failure, uh, basically receiving this treatment as we speak. Now, about 15 years ago, we started to look at how we could actually scale up these technologies. We were making them by hand. And really, scale up and manufacturing was important. So we started looking at possibly using your typical desktop inkjet printer to print these structures. It worked experimentally, but not for patients. So we had to build these more sophisticated printers that we've developed over a 14-year period that are specifically designed to print tissues and organs. And these printers are able to do so by allowing us to really create the structures the way you need them for patients. And basically, when we talk about uh, 3D printing, we're also talking about manufacturing and really allowing the manufacturing of these technologies to be made in a reliable manner so you can scale it up. And so we have this Regenerative Medicine Manufacturing Innovation Consortium that's composed of about 30 different companies and about 30 academic institutions, basically bringing these technologies to the bench, from the bench to the bedside by accelerating the development of these manufacturing techniques as well as looking at workforce development. So to summarize, then, what I've tried to do for you today is really give you a very brief overview of some of these technologies where we can use materials alone, cells and materials together, cells alone, different strategies like 3D printing to create these organs. And we talked about the complexity of the organs. Level one, flat structures being the least complex. Tubular structures being the second level of complexity. Hollow non-tubular organs and finally solid organs. And at this point, Regenerative medicine's been able to make a dent in some of these technologies. And finally, to leave you with a brief video clip of a patient who was treated with one of these organs, there's an interview he gave 10 years after receiving his organ. 
I was really sick. I, I could barely get out of bed. I was missing school. It was just pretty much miserable. I couldn't, you know, go out and play, you know, basketball at recess without feeling like I was going to pass out when I got back inside. It was, I felt so sick. I was facing basically a lifetime of dialysis and I don't even like to think about what my life would be like if I was on that. So after the surgery, um, life got a lot better for me. I was able to do more things. I was able to wrestle in high school. I became the captain of the team and that was great. I was able to be, you know, the normal kid with my friends and because they use my own cells to, you know, build this bladder, it's going to be with me. I got it for life. The promise of the field is such that there's still many challenges ahead. We, there are really many challenges. We still have challenges for manufacturing, uh, challenges for cost, bringing the cost down, et cetera. But one thing is certain, and that is that these technologies do have the potential to make patients' lives better. And like Janet mentioned, the need for the field is really re real and it's there. And we need to move forward with funding. We need to move forward with workforce development and manufacturing and better guidelines. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Tony. Our next speaker is David Pierce, who is the president of innovation and research at Sanford Health and also professor of pediatrics at the Sanford School of Medicine, University of South Dakota. Dave. Thank you. Thanks, Fred. So David Pierce, I'm the president for innovation uh, and research at Sanford Health. Just to start, I thought I should probably introduce uh, what Sanford Health is, as many of you might not be aware uh, who Sanford Health is. So uh, we're the, one of the largest non-for-profit uh, healthcare organizations in the United States. Um, and we have long-term care facilities across the entire United States due to a recent uh, acquisition of the Good Samaritan Society. Our main base is in the Midwest, in the Dakotas, so where most of you fly over, but we do have uh, a couple million patients there. So I'm here today to tell you about our patients want regenerative medicine, and as a health system, we felt responsible that we need to bring regenerative medicine in a responsible manner to our patients. So we're a fully integrated health system. Not just do we deliver care, but we also have our own health plan. And about 10 years ago, we established a research arm. And that's the arm that was charged with the, the idea of let's legitimize the use of adult-derived stem cells uh, in therapeutics. So where have we gone with that? Well, first of all, you know, we had one of the first FDA-approved clinical trials in orthopedics. We work with the FDA. Obviously, we're a large health system. We have to make sure we follow the rules and regulations. But first of all, we want to make sure we do the right thing for our patients. Other shout outs for Sanford are that we had the first fast track uh, FDA approved clinical trial for type 1 diabetes. We've introduced gene therapy into fatal children's neurogenetic diseases and a cutting edge HER2 vaccine trial in breast cancer. Our research is about our patients. Sure, we have some academic research as well, but our research has to be real. It has to in impact our patients. So specifically with respect to today's agenda, so our little avatars here really just so show some of the inflammation or damage that happened to our joints as we age or through our activities. So what we decided to do was make an impact in applying adult-derived stem cells drawn for, by lipoaspiration. So uh, it's a cheap way of doing liposuction. Trust me, you won't lose weight from that. Not too much. 50 cc's of your own cells can be taken and then put in basically into a centrifuge system that shakes these cells, collects these cells, and that has an enzyme digestion. So we can purify a population of these cells and then re-inject them into your own body. This is autologous, and so I'm going to talk about four FDA clinical trials that are either ongoing or completed right now, where we want to bring this to our patients. It's not just the patients that come to us and say we want regenerative medicine. How many of you as physicians have patients that have had sold regenerative medicine to them, and it's not been real, it's not been effective? And it probably hasn't even been regenerative in any, any sense of the word. So, so where are we at? So um, a variety of conditions can be impacted uh, in orthopedics with respect to this. So osteoarthritis is clearly an area where if you take these cells, who, by the way, have the most appropriate lineage to cartilage and to bone as compared to other cells, they have an either an anti-inflammatory response 
or potentially a regenerative response. Science is moving so much faster than the regulations right now. There's two ways you can assess the impact of these cells on osteoarthritis. First of all, pain. If your patients are actually benefiting, that's a clinical outcome. And then, of course, the regenerative part is through imaging. And then I don't think many people want to sign up for a biopsy to see if they actually did truly regenerate something. Fortunately, the clinical trials don't require that just yet. Our animal studies show that we are regenerating. So in wrist osteoarthritis, we're injecting these stem cells right now. We're just past halfway for this safety trial uh, with respect to taking the stem cells from your own individuals. And it's a randomized clinical trial with a cortisone control. Cortisone is the standard of care for this type of uh, pain metric that you would have right now. Next up, back pain. Boy, a lot of people have back pain. So facet joint back pain is the other, air, other trial that we're ongoing right now. Again, the exact same approach, collecting these adipose-derived stem cells and the fraction there, and injecting your own stem cells into back pain through this FDA-approved clinical trial. So then the one that I went in the, the reverse order here is, is we now have a pivotal trial. The first two were safety trials, but we've already completed a safety trial for rotator cuff. 18 patients were randomized, 12 received uh, the, the stem cell fraction, and six received uh, cortisone control. That manuscript, because you have to get, you know, publish these things, is currently uh, literally just about to be uh, submitted. Obviously, as a safety trial, it's underpowered for efficacy, but the secondary outcome, we obviously did measure pain scores, quality of life, and such forth. 12 patients, 11 of whom received, uh, you know, clearly beneficial uh, pain scores and quality of life. Um, and the imaging is quite encouraging, and that's why we moved on to that pivotal trial uh, that is now ongoing across multiple sites across the United States. And then finally, whose stem cells are better, right? Many of you in the room will, you know, anecdotally talk about the different sources of stem cells. I told you, Sanford Health, we're trying to do this for our patients. They need answers. So fortunately, working with the, the Marcus Foundation, uh, Dr. Sanfilippo introduced us to some wonderful people, and our partner organizations are up there now. We have a clinical trial that was approved by the FDA in rapid time. I want to congratulate my team, Fred's team, and the FDA, where we have a clinical trial now where we're comparing adipose-derived stem cells, bone marrow aspirate stem cells, with Joanne's called tissue-derived mesenchymal stem cells in a totally randomized study in knee osteoarthritis. Who's going to win that? We don't know. Is there going to be a winner? Will they work? But that's the one clinical trial that's ongoing right now. What I'd just like to emphasize here, and it really resonates with the theme, all of these trials that I describe are either supported by Sanford Health, the health system that's doing it for their patients, or by philanthropy. We must do better for our patients. We must make research and clinical trials real and applicable. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Our next speaker is Joanne Kurtzberg, the Jerome Harris Distinguished Professor of Pediatrics, the Director of the Marcus Center for Cellular Cures, and the Director of the Pediatric Blood and Bone Marrow Transplant Program at Duke University, North Carolina. Yes. <laughs> is there another Duke? <laughs> okay. So, I'm a pediatrician, so I'm going to talk about how there's a need for regenerative medicine therapies in children, um, and also about work that we are doing at Duke with cord blood and cord tissue derived stem and other cells. And a lot of um, marketing tactics use the language that cord blood is a bag of stem cells, but it is really not a bag of stem cells. And I made a cartoon just to say cord blood has many different kinds of cells. The blood stem cells, which are at the top, make up less than 1% of the cells in the bag. Um, and there are other relevant and important cells that, may be, that are being um, studied to derive therapeutics from cord blood today. My team is working with the monocytes, but the lymphocytes over on your right are also very important cells. And um, in my own work, we're also look, working with cord tissue to make the me mesenchymal stromal cells, uh, which we have in clinical trials. 
Um, now, this is just a, a chart of what is going on at Duke and is only meant to represent a view of the possible scope of therapies that are available. But at Duke, we're using cord blood, both from the child and, and or from a donor in children with birth asphyxia, cerebral palsy, autism. And we're also using it in adults with acute ischemic stroke. And we're studying cord tissue, MSCs, in um, some of the same diseases, HIE, CP, autism. And then, um, as David told you, we're participating in the arthritis trial. Um, I want to make two points. One, cord blood is a source of cells for transplant. And when you use it for hematopoietic cell transplantation, the patient has myeloablative therapy. They're, it's very risky. It's life-threatening. It's complex. It takes a long time. And that is reserved for life-threatening diseases. In the other studies I'm telling you about on the right-hand side of the slide, we are not giving chemotherapy. We are not expecting the cord blood cells or the tissue cells to engraft. We're expecting them to do a job and then be destroyed in the body. And they work through signaling, not through engraftment. And there's no chemotherapy. Um, there is no transplant. Um, now, we've studied a lot in our laboratory uh, ways that cord blood cells might help the brain. We got the idea to do that because in transplanting children with metabolic diseases and leukodystrophies, we learned that cord blood cells go to the brain. Um, this just shows you a cartoon. I don't know how well it's, uh, can, you can see it, but you have the slide where on the left, you have normal brain in what's called an organic typic culture. This is mouse brain in slice culture, and you can maintain it for a month. And if we shock the tissue by depriving it of oxygen, it, it, the green cells, which are neurons, in the middle die. But if we shock the tissue and then we put back cord blood monocytes or cord blood mononuclear cells, the tissue is rescued. So that's on the left. Um, and that's how we got the idea that something was happening through the cord blood cells to rescue the tissue. Likewise, with the cord tissue MSCs, uh, we have an interest in autism. We know in autism the microglia, which is a structural cell in the brain, are inflamed. So we developed an assay where we could inflame the microglia in the middle and then put cord tissue cells on the microglia and see if it would calm down the inflammation. And the, it does on the right and through the graph. And we use that as an assay to evaluate the um, MSCs that we manufacture that we use in clinical trials with autism. Now, autism is um, not an uncommon disease. It is not rare. The latest estimates are that it affects 1 in 59 children in the United States. Um, and it's increasing, and no one knows why. But I would bet everyone in this room knows somebody who either has autism or has a child with autism. So it's a big medical problem. We have been studying the use of cord blood infusions in children with autism um, and have published a phase one trial uh, in 25 children, which basically showed that in the red, children who had a nonverbal IQ greater than 70 had improvement in some of the core symptoms of autism measured on a behavioral test called the Vineland Socialization Scale. And um, that is the population we then targeted for a much bigger phase two randomized placebo-controlled trial. Um, we also use neurophysiologic endpoints because behavioral endpoints are somewhat subjective. Um, and one of the things we're developing uh, with Jerry Dawson, who's at our center, is eye tracking, where a child watches a video and autistic children watch this video differently in terms of where their eyes gaze than a typically developing child. So we just finished a randomized placebo-controlled trial in 180 children. We're going to be publishing the results soon, looking at effects of autologous or donor cord blood against a placebo in children with autism. And I don't have time today to show you results, but we're also doing a similar design testing uh, the cord tissue MSCs in children with autism. Um, likewise, we've studied cord blood infusions in children with cerebral palsy and performed a randomized placebo-controlled trial, which is published in stem cell translational medicine. And in that trial, it took four years to find 65 children, or 63, sorry, children, who had a qualified privately banked cord blood unit. But we did, and we studied this. And the take-home message is that children who got the right cell dose, and we studied cell dose, had an increase in motor function above what would have been predicted by normal development in children with CP 
and that that was associated with new tracks in the brain, in, and that's what those pictures on the bottom show in red, um, in um, the motor tracks of the brain, and the correlation of increased function and new motor tracks was noted. And for me, a picture is probably worth a thousand words, so here's a little boy on the study whose baseline walks with a walker, scissors his legs, has braces, can't walk independently, and here is this child one year later um, where he's able to walk independently, climb over a bar, has better balance, is not spastic. And that amount of change is more than you would see in a normal kid with CP having normal development. So think about how that changed that child's life. Think about how it changed that family's life. And we want to be able to do more of this. Um, we also, because of this work, open and expanded access protocol for children who are not eligible for our clinical trials but have qualified autologous or sibling cord blood. And all I can tell you is I have more than 20,000 emails in my special inbox for these emails of families who really want to come for this therapy, which I didn't mention but is safe, uh, while we try to find out if it's effective. And so I don't know how to reconcile personally doing it right, doing the clinical trials, taking the time it takes to do that, getting the resources it takes to do that, and knowing there are so many patients waiting that could be helped when it's safe. So in conclusion, from my work, uh, both autologous and allogeneic cord blood are showing excellent safety profiles, and they suggest efficacy in phase two trials. Um, we know we have to do phase three trials and work through the approval process with FDA. We think the monocytes are the active cell, um, and um, we believe these therapies have the potential to treat diseases with unmet needs and to change human lives. And I'll just end with this slide I'm not going to go through, but represents the team at Duke and our collaborators and our funders. Um, and again, I will echo what David said. All of this work has been funded through the Marcus Foundation or the Robertson Foundation, not through NIH or other mechanisms. And I would love to see expansion of the ability of uh, governmental funding, particularly at academic centers, so we can work faster and learn which therapies are effective and make them available. But it takes a village. It, it's not a simple thing where one person can do this in a street corner. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you.